Yeah, you know, it's it, for me, there, uh, yeah, for you maybe, because I, some of you I saw earlier this day, and now the red is getting a little bit too red for me, and I cannot go to my hotel room anymore because <laughs> it's perfect. Okay, the woman in red, so um, it's me. Um, Let's start this session. Uh, welcome everybody and uh, for the ones who just arrived and didn't see me one of these days wearing something else. Um, my name is Marianne Olvers. I'm a professor in sports law in the Netherlands at the Free University in Amsterdam. And I work on the topic of match fixing since 2013. And till this day we didn't have any court case in the Netherlands. Does this mean that there is no match fixing in the Netherlands? No, because in 2013 I already concluded with a other scientist, uh, Twan Spapons, that there, yes, there is match fixing, but still today I had to talk on the radio this morning and the question was, uh, Marianne, <laughs> why don't we have any cases in the Netherlands? I said, maybe. Maybe the prosecution is not working hard enough, but um, I don't know. <laughs> uh, that was a joke, sorry. But um, till today, the fact is that there is still no court case. We have had other cases. We have had, um, for example, the Cargbo case. Um, and I don't, yeah, Cheert Veenstar from the integrity unit of the Royal Dutch Foot Football Association is also present. So we had some cases, but they never went to court till this day. So we are a white spot in the Netherlands. Um, but we have nice speakers today. And it's my final session, and then I think I long for a drink, so uh, um, maybe you too. But let's have also, you know, I look forward to a great discussion about this topic. And I know there we, we sp speak a lot about match fixing, and I hope also that you will join the discussion later on so we can move this topic a little bit further, because I always have the feeling that we are just starting to know something about the phenomenon. Okay, um, uh, I ask now Marius Sprenger to join us. Um, his session is called Can we fix the match fixing problem? An ancient based model to fight the biggest threat to modern sports. Welcome. Hi, uh, thank you very much for the introduction. Um, my name is Marius and I um, deal with the question of whether or not we can fix the match fixing problem. And um, my approach to do that is using a technique called agent based modeling. Um, quick introduction about myself, who am I, why am I here? Um, so I'm an information systems student at the University of Germany, which means that I have a um, computer science background and I try to use that to sort of tackle that this problem. And I've been a research assistant for about two years now using agent-based modeling. I will get to that in a minute, um, what that is and why it might be helpful in this scenario. So um, here we have a few headlines from the past century um, who are supposed to sort of represent uh, the phenomena. So we can see there was an incident in baseball around 60 years ago. Um, a scandal in boxing at the Olympics, um, a BBC report reported widespread match fixing in tennis, uh, match fixing in Formula One and in football. So what this is show us, um, it's not only, first of all, it's not only a local problem, but um, that can, is only occurs in one or a few countries, but it, it's a global problem. And second of all, um, it cannot be limited to a small number of sports, but that almost any sports is suggestible to the idea of mat max fit, uh, match fixing. So um, this empirical research led to me sort of classifying three involved parties in the match fixing process for my model. First of all, these are athletes who compete in the tournament. Second, um, as I called it, a betting mafia. Um, operating in the background, offering bribes um, to gain economic benefit, and second, a control authority 
Um, there are many examples out there actually who try to fight match fixing. For example, the Tennis Integrity Unit or efforts by the IOC or the respective football leagues. Um, then agent-based um, modeling. I think it's important to um, understand the technique or concept before I go into my specific model. So um, an agent-based model is a computer program. And what we do there is we create an artificial world. So we have a real life phenomena, which we try to picture and put into this um, artificial computer program. Um, then uh, in this artificial world, we have agents acting in them. What can those agents be? First of all, people, people obviously, but also um, organizations, a government, all sorts of companies and um, those agents interact with each other. And by this interaction, uh, we try to draw conclusions in the computer model, which we then can reapply to the real world. How does this look in my model specifically? So um, I created um, a medium high number of agents, namely 100 athletes, and um, I subdivided them into three behavioral types to explain their behavior. The first type is a, um, a rational agent type who um, makes decisions based on a mathematical um, utility function. The second type is a social type whose decisions are based on a social network. And a second, an ethical type um, who we could describe as a rule compliant, um, strictly following the rules. Um, as I said in the introduction, we have a betting mafia who offers bribes to those athletes in order to gain economic benefit. And we have a control authority who applies counter mechanisms. Um, important feature is that we have heterogeneous agents, meaning that we um, apply um, individual att attributes to every athlete. Those attributes can be obviously the age or um, a risk perception, stuff like just to name a few. Um, and um, as I said, there is an interaction with the environment and this interaction can be subject to variation. Um, a very important feature of an agent-based model um, are the temporal aspects, meaning that um, we have a simulation and we look at that over time and the development over time. And um, in this model, we also through that have an age-related decision process. Um, important to say is that we also have adaptive agents. So decisions they make during the simulations are not predefined before the simulations, but rather um, they may vary during every period depending on the circumstances. Then what happens in every simulation period? Um, we create um, randomly assigned two athletes to each other. So we have a pair that competes against each other and um, both athletes have a talent strength. Um, so there is a ranking of every athlete. And then what the betting mafia does, it targets the um, athlete with the higher talent strength because the economic output of that athlete losing would obviously be much higher. And um, then the match fixing decision is based on the respective uh, behavioral type criteria. Just to give you an impression of how that computer program looks like. Um, so here on the right side, we could come to the code. Right now we have about 5,000 lines of code, which might give you an impression of the complex computation that's taking place. And um, here in the interface, we conduct our analysis. Here on the right in the field, you can see the agents acting. Um, if you would scroll further down, we have the area to specify all these attributes that might influence the match fixing decision. Those are, I don't know if you can read it. Yeah. Um, so for example, a specify fixed income for every player. We could increase or decrease the win bonus, the fine for being detected, um, the, um, the bribe, the bribing amount. Um, we could decre increase how many in periods an athlete would be banned after being convicted. Um, and um, by varying all these attributes, we can see the outcome and then, in the best case, draw conclusions from it. Um, that's what I did in my first base analysis, as I like to call it. Um, here you can see an analysis over 100 periods. Um, for example, the, um, the white line is the... Uh, 
the social type, the green line is the rational type, the red line who does not participate in match fixing, the red line uh, in, in, on the bottom, and the black line is the number of detected athletes. So just as an example, um, if you look at period 10, there we increased the number of banned periods, um, which led to a dramatic drop in the rational type. Um, and if you look at the white line, you can see that this affects the social type um, a few periods later as well. Um, just a quick overview, overview of these analysis results. Um, we can see that the betting, ma mafia, the betting mafias have the potential to dramatically influence the match fixing decision of the rational type with a higher bribery bonus and that also has effects on the social type. But there are things the control authority can do. Um, they can counteract with, for example, higher fines and bans. But interestingly, um, uh, sorry, a higher win bonus and higher bans, but interestingly, a higher fine in the model appeared to not have a significant influence, so a one-time fine. Um, in general, when talking about detection rate, how do we find those athletes who participate in match fixing? They could achieve a higher detection rate, but only with significantly higher efforts. Okay, so this already leads to my conclusion. Um, what I present here is, is not a final or complete model. It's basically an idea to use computer simulation in order to um, develop mechanisms. Um, I think that it has the power to be a very effective tool if used right in the fight against match fixing. Um, and we can see that the base model already delivers first results, but those obviously need to be further specified and extended in the future. Just a few ideas on how could these extensions look like. Um, for example, we could further introduce athlete experience. So looking further at the background of the athlete, then um, introduce an adaptive targeting process. Um, for example, for the betting mafia, it might be interesting to see who has participated in match fixing before, who is suggestible to the idea, do we target them again? Um, an important topic over the last few days was whistleblowing. It might be interesting to introduce that and to also give referees a role in the process. Um, so that's about it. Thank you for your attention. If you have any questions, feel free to ask them in the Q&A session or via email. Thank you. I can stay here. Yeah, sorry. Yeah, this is working. Uh, one question, Do this model, does this differ from... Uh, do you make a distinction between sports or is that not necessary? Um, no, right now not. Well, yeah. um, the fact that we have two athletes competing against each other is based on tennis. Yeah. Um, it might be in introduce, uh, interesting to introduce, for example, team sports in yeah. a more developed model. But right now, it's, there's no distinction, no. No. But do you think that will differ, that it will make a difference, whether it's an individual sport or a team sport for your model? Mm. So, for now? For now, I don't know. No. It might be interesting to find that's out. The, that's the best question for a scientist. <laughs> we don't know. We have to <laughs> research. Thank you. Uh, um, so I will now invite um, Els de Wagener. She is a postdoctoral researcher at the Ghent University. And she will talk to us, of course, about match fixing, but what makes an athlete rig a match? Which is, I wonder, is it money? Uh, good afternoon, everybody. Um, I'm going to talk to you about a framework to analyze factors that make athletes agree or not agree to fix a match. Of course, we all know it's a worldwide problem and very detrimental to the sports sector. However, no conceptual framework has been presented to analyze if and why athletes agree to fix a match. This is not working anymore. Working. 
Yes, thank you. Um, several authors have discussed how people come to behave in an ethical or an unethical way. And uh, the most complete model uh, I find is put forward by REST. He says that any form of ethical behavior can be broken into a four-step process. And a person needs to fulfill these four conditions in order to establish an ethical act. Um, I'll take you through the four steps. The first one is moral sensitivity. This uh, means the ability of a person to interpret a situation and recognize the moral issues that come with it. When it comes to doping, for instance, uh, people have to know that some products are on the list of prohibited substance substances. For match fixing, uh, people have to realize that losing on purpose, for instance, is an ethical issue. Then comes the second step, moral judgment, where uh, the people uh, where the person comes to a moral evaluation of the ethical issue at hand. In practice, this means an answer to the question, do I find this behavior ethically correct or not? In doping, this could be uh, that you uh, don't want to use uh, substances. In match fixing, this could be that uh, you say that fixing a match is ethically wrong. However, the moral judgment is not the final step. After the judgment, uh, there has to be the intention to choose the value of morality formulated in the moral judgment over different interests, uh, such as winning at all costs, power, fame, money. So uh, in doping, this could be uh, that you decide that match fixing is wrong, uh, that, uh, that doping is wrong, however, you really, really want to win. Um, match fixing, this could be that uh, you think that fixing a match is ethically wrong, but um, the financial interests outweigh your ethical value. And finally, the moral character step. This means putting your moral motivation into practice. So the ability to follow through with the moral decision and to actually behave in this way. To my students, I always say, uh, give the example of a wonderful piece of chocolate cake, you know it's not good for your health, but still, and you decide not to eat it, but still it can happen that you uh, give in to the craving. So moral character is lacking there, the willpower to act on your moral motivation. This can also be the case in ethical sport issues, such as match fixing. So the model of rest presents us uh, a way uh, to analyze in which steps a failure occurs uh, when an ethical and unethical um, act is being made. In this case, the agreement to fix a match. Um, it is important for our knowledge on the decision-making process in which steps athletes need more guiding in order not to give in into match-fixing proposals. Um, different strategies to combat match fixing need to be in place when, for instance, there's mostly a lack of awareness, step one. Athletes do not think of match fixing as something wrong. When athletes condemn match fixing but are driven by money or other interests, or when they can't handle the pressure or fear that comes with a fixing proposal. Um, I've conducted a survey in Flanders in, uh, in football clubs a questionnaire followed by interviews to assess the personal and contextual factors that lead to agreeing to fix a match. This is ongoing uh, research, so I won't give you uh, any definite numbers, but I will be able to show you some uh, clear trends already. Um, what came out of the research very early was a big difference between the non-betting related corruption uh, with the aim of getting certain results on the sports fields and the betting-related corruption with the aim of financial gain and money laundering. When we look at the REST model applied to the non-betting-related match-fixing, we see a problem in uh, three different steps. Um, the moral sensitivity is lacking in a lot of cases. Uh, athletes don't see intentional loss as match fixing, but consider it a mere strategy, for instance. Also, uh, they don't consider match fixing if they realize when this is match fixing, they don't consider it wrong because they see no harm in helping out another team, as they called it. 
uh, motivation is mostly okay in these cases, but then again, the moral character comes into play uh, with the group pressure. Uh, they uh, seem to go along with the rest of the team when offered uh, to fix a match. This uh, is uh, opposed to the betting-related match fixing, where we see different pro problems, different steps are, uh, are sensible to uh, the fixing. The moral sensitivity is mostly not a uh, problem. They are aware of the ethical debate on match fixing, on betting-related match fixing. The moral judgment is okay as well. They do see match fixing as wrong, which was not the case in the non-betting related uh, corruption. However, the motivation, the financial aspects uh, outweigh uh, the ethical value, the moral judgment they make in step two. And also, uh, fear was an important factor, the lack of moral character. So fear was an important factor to agree in a fix, even if they judged that this was wrong. So the different kinds of uh, fixing need definitely different approaches when it comes to raising awareness and uh, installing correct judgment in athletes, and also when it comes to preventing athletes to take part in a proposed fix. Thank you. Do you think there is also a cultural aspect between sports? For example, when you look at cycling, mm -hmm. um, I think our moral judgment is a little bit different than, for example, in football, when it comes, for example, the Tour de France. Mm -hmm. And you see these two guys dealing with each other, mm -hmm. and you think, okay, who will win? Is th did you look into this? I looked into other sports as well, and indeed there's a, di a, a different uh, approach especially it co when it comes to the moral, um, the moral judgment. In some sports, it really is considered as a strategy, a tactic tool yeah. to, to arrange something, whether in other sports it is really um, judged, judged as wrong. So yes. there's a clear difference across, uh, across sports. I've looked into badminton and tennis as well, and there we see a difference, for instance, um, when we recall the badminton scandal at the uh, uh, London Olympic yeah. Games, um, most badminton players, I, I, people in the badminton world or badminton athletes themselves, I spoke to, they didn't consider this as match fixing, as a wrong act, but they saw it as a strategic and therefore allowed act in the whole process and they didn't find it fair that their sport uh, wasn't given this opportunity whether other sports uh, did get the culture where this is accepted. Yeah, I understand. Thank you for your interesting lecture. Thank you. Yeah, now it's me, myself and I, I think. Um, so, yeah, it's the first time I give a lecture and I also have to, to chair, so it's, it's a little bit difficult. Um, so I will ask myself uh, a lot of questions. Um, there is always a first time, yeah, for everything. Okay, I, uh, I did some research, I did uh, quite some research since uh, 2013. I started with uh, Twan Spapens from Tilburg University, where, and the question was whether there was match fixing in the Netherlands, and of course the answer was yes, there is. And then I uh, further proceed with uh, more researchers. I worked uh, together with a lot of uh, yeah, researchers uh, from French, for example, uh, Christian Kahn, and uh, Pim Verschuren uh, on other topics. So, and this is now also not working. Can you try? Oh, now it's getting. So we started with this program uh, which was called um, Bad Monitor Alert. This is a part of three programs funded by uh, the European Commission. Paolo will later talk of uh, one of the other researches that has been done in this perspective. The other is called, and is also really interesting, uh, is Crime Bet. And you can even, you know, you can Google, Google 
bad monitor alert PDF and you find the research. And, uh, so this research was uh, done by Christian Kalp and by me, but we had a lot of help and also from uh, Chert Veenstra who is here and a lot of other people, like for example, Mal uh, Mallory uh, Tranois helped me on the legal issues, but also Laurent Vidal, uh, well known also in this field for his research on this topic. Of course, I will not. Uh, of course, you have many types of match fixing, but we, of course, for this um, research, we focused only on betting-related sport, uh, sports manipulation. So we, uh, we, of course, how we started. Um, it was a really huge project because we had to focus on 28 member states, and uh, so we get all these legal documents from all the 28 member states. We interviewed a lot of people. It was an awful task, I can tell you, but, but in the end, uh, we had so much documentations. I think it's, it, yeah, yesterday was the topic of big data, but it felt like big data. And then, of course, we had to analyze all these uh, things, and then uh, we made up conclusions, and we discussed a lot, and we discussed even more, and we went to French and to Paris, and, and then afterward, we fo uh, finally could finalize uh, this, uh, this whole report. And, okay, what did we do? Uh, we studied the betting monitoring systems, and the betting monitoring systems, yeah, that's a technical system, of course, uh, which monitor sports betting market all the time. They monitor all the games and they monitor all the time a lot of bets placed also on, on uh, the, the sports betting market. And next to this, we also have an alert system. And that, for me, is like a red flag when you see something and then you see, okay, there is possible manipulation going on. And that's what we call an alert system. But, of course... Um, it's, uh, it's hard to separate the two because monitoring also sometimes looks like an alert system and the other way around. But with, when it comes to an alert, you have more information, like, for example, also from the sports organizations, and you have to gather all this information, and that's some, a lot of work, and then you can say, okay, this is a red flag, we think there is man manipulation going on. Our objective was, okay, we had to propose various measures to improve the detection of cases. And, of course, next to this, we also examined the role of alert mechanisms and the cooperation. And that, for me, that was one of my research topics uh, between public and private actors. And what we see, of course, it's very hard, especially today, um, when I was this morning on the radio, it's, it's hard to work together in one country, and we are not such a big country in the Netherlands, but let's say match fixing in, is an international problem. So how do we work together with, for example, Germany, we, um, or Belgium or whatsoever, but think of working with Singapore or Thailand or, you know, all these other jurisdictions. Uh, so it's, it's a really a difficult topic. These are the stages, of course, but I will go to the... What, what did we do? We draft a lot of questionnaires. We did interviews, legal questionnaires. We had workshops and then we had the analysis. So it was not only a theoretical approach, but also what we did was a retrospective approach. So what we did was we studied a lot of match-fixing cases, proven match-fixing cases, and then we went all the way back. Did we, uh, what can we say about, for example, the use of the monitoring systems in that cases? Did they play a role, the monitoring uh, reports, or not? And in what way, and how did you weigh the evidence? So... Okay, we found, in the end, we found there's no ideal monitoring system. Okay, we were looking, of course, for an ideal monitoring system, but uh, I don't know if there is any. But maybe in the future, when I look into the future, I hope that one day we will we'll have uh, some kind of system, maybe with the use of big data, where we can say, okay, statistics shows this match is fixed, so it's up to you now 
to say that it's not fixed, you know, that we change the proof of evidence. So that would be like we do, for example, in doping. Eh? If you find something in the urine, okay, you have to prove that it's not your fault that's in there. And maybe we will come up later on with a system where uh, the standard of proof is that high that we can also use it in court cases. But at this moment, we are not that far. Um, of course, there are some few. There are a few uh, efficient systems, like, for example, and that, uh, of course, is the most well known, is of Sports Radar. But Sports Radar is also also a commercial firm selling also quotes. For me, that always makes me feel a little bit uncomfortable. Although they say they have these Chinese walls, but Chinese walls, as a legal professional, I don't believe in Chinese walls. It's not a belief. I think you have to separate these two. And then, um, of course, the most sports that which were um, f monitored are football, tennis and basketball. But what we see in the Netherlands, and we, s uh, we have checked this also, that we see also now other sports coming up. And uh, even you can bet on youth sports or whatsoever. So uh, not everything is monitored. Um, then when it comes to the rate of false negatives, this means when betting patterns flag as non-suspicious, where in fact the sports competition was manipulated, we see in this research that the false negatives are quite significant. And the rate uh, of false positive, on the other hand, where betting patterns flagged as suspicious were in fact where in fact there was no manipulations is very low. So the possibility of a fix is in that case very high. And of course, monitoring reports help in criminal cases, but when it comes to the standard of proof, especially in criminal cases, beyond reasonable doubt and not comfortable satisfaction, as in disciplinary cases, yeah, it requires a lot of proof. And today, one of the cases, I think there is a lot of proof in the Netherlands, the Cargbo case, uh, you can look on internet and maybe uh, later we can talk about this case. There is so much evidence, but still nothing happens on the prosecution front. Um, and next to this, it's really nice. I, I don't have the time because uh, I'm, I'm sharing this session, so I will keep, uh, you know, I have to look at the time. But um, the dark net, there is a really nice chapter about the working of the dark net in, in the report. And I just say, okay, it's, it's like, you know, it, it reads like some crime novel or something. So it's really nice to, to read. But on the other hand, it's also really gives you insight information about how the dark net works. And we see there anonymous betting. We see there, for example, um, using people using bitcoins, and you even can, uh, for example, um, uh, get information about which match will be fixed in the upcoming days. So, you know, a lot of information on the dark net. On the, uh, when it comes to alerts, of course, there are different types. We see the working of national platforms, but we only have a couple of national platforms now in place, and they're not structured um, everywhere the same. They have not the same legal position in the countries. So, you know, we're just starting there, and it's also very hard to exchange information. In the Netherlands, for example, uh, um, we look at each other, but to really exchange information when it comes for, you know, for example, a criminal point of view, um, everybody keeps silent. So it's, it's really hard also because of privacy issues. The quali quality of the information is uh, not always that good. Eh? Uh, you, if you want to use some information, it has to be um, of a high quality, otherwise you have nothing. And uh, so also this can be improved. So when it comes to, we have a lot of um, uh, recommendations to see, but I just want to get you, you uh, a few into the future. Maybe we can, uh, yeah, I hope that big data can give us some support in the future. Um, I think we need to go uh, into depth more uh, in other sectors, for example, we can learn a lot about the financial sector, how it works, how it's, uh, uh, how it's regulated, and what we can learn, for example, for the betting market. And 
in the end, of course, how we can improve information. Information is key, and till today, it's so hard to exchange information, even in the Netherlands, but even abroad. So, um, but that's, that's more, you know, the last sentence is more, it's more about my frustration in this topic. Uh, how can we get a little bit less frustrated in, uh, in the future? Thank you, and I will go now because time's up there, and I will introduce... It's like, you know, I, I have to switch uh, roles, and uh, really, for me, this is uh, really a little bit hard. Um, Nicolas um, fixed, the, uh, fixed the fixing project about proactive um, quelling sports events manipulation. Can I ask you on stage? Thank you. I stole this, sorry. Yeah, thank you. Hello, everybody. Thank you very much for this opportunity to present another European program uh, that is called Fix the Fixing. Uh, I'm representing one partner of uh, the consortium that is called CARE, Fair Play Code, and we are acting as national integrity platform. Uh, the first uh, documented evidence about mat fixing in Europe came from Europol. And that was uh, the idea when we were drafting um, uh, this project. So we tried to have a consortium of different places in Europe, from the southeastern to the very northwest. So we created a consortium of uh, think tanks, academics, and national sport uh, integrity organizations. We followed the guidelines of the European Union to this project and also meeting all the efforts of uh, EU member states and uh, policy actors, including the Council of Europe, uh, to our project. So we had uh, specific goals, uh, but mainly we wanted for the first time to provide uh, to, the, to, to the European decision makers a quantitative survey in order to have scientific evidence about match fixing in Europe, uh, at least in seven countries. I will uh, provide you some statistics according to the psychological determinants of match fixing that we found already. The, the survey is still ongoing through Qualtrics. Uh, so it's not only football, as you see. It goes to the major uh, sport, sports in Europe that are popular, even at the gymnastics. Uh, the demographics has a mean of age 24, uh, mostly men, but from the professional side of sport, but also from the amateur and grassroots sports. So we had uh, a mix of questions. Yes, 12% played in a match that was fixed. Yes, 34. We have suspicious that matches are fixed. Yes, 15. Approached to fix a match. The majority of the players said that are club officials, national sport organizations, leagues, and national Libby committee officials that are the cause of this problem. Other players, 16%, 9% referee, or other game official as a commissar, and only 9% that someone outside, those that we are called match fixers. 
of course, our system, uh, our statistics system has a, a lot of combinations. We compared Greece, Cyprus, and Austria. Uh, by the end of the year, we will have a loose, uh, uh, um, uh, a big uh, and total uh, statistic uh, uh, view. But as you see, there are differences between South and Central or uh, North Europe. So in Greece, 34% will approve teammates to fix the match. But in Austria, would your teammates object to fix the game? 77%. The reasons. Mostly financial problems and poverty. Unpaid players. Players with difficult difficulties to survive and feed their families. Pressure, 27%, easy money, greediness, 23%, 16% pressure from outside, match fixers, 14%, threats of violence, 9%, cultural, general, pathetic acceptance of fixed games, very interesting. Another group of questions. Allowed to place a bet on a match playing in? 17% answer in a wrong way. Staff in club are allowed to play in a bet that a team is played in? Again, 22% almost. They didn't give us the correct answer, and so on. About the risk factors, I will stay at the individual. Athletes, they have problem with gambling. They are addicted to sport betting. Anticipated pride, interference, and moral disengagement. And as far as the contextual request from powerful stakeholder. Again, individual, anticipated, regret, guilt, shame, anger, moral identity, but willingness to blow the whistle and report. What are the reasons not to fix? Personal, honest integrity, letting down family and relatives, letting down the team and fans. Top opinions for prevention, wages paid in on time, better working conditions, more information, more education, more training. Athletes, they don't know about math fixing, and there is nobody to inform them. Parallel, we did uh, uh, a mass media research through the social networks. Uh, I, do I don't want to stay more to save time, but if you follow this uh, URL, you will find the full information about uh, a complication of uh, data we collected through social media, mainly Twitter. So we have uh, a metastasis in all popular European sports. We have a metastasis of this cancer in other sports, racket sports, even water sports in Greece, water polo. We have also metastasis in, uh, in friendly matches. We see also metastasis in grassroots sports because we have answers from, uh, answers from athletes that they are playing in academies and in lower, edge, lower categories, lower leagues. My fellow Aristotle from Greece, tolerance and apathy. International sport organizations and international lottery associations, they have to consider the words of Aristotle about tolerance and apathy. At the same time, European Parliament, European Union, and European decision makers and policy makers who also think themselves about the quote of Aristotle, are they practicing tolerance and apathy? Nevertheless, whatever the international organizations, sport organizations do, the public opinion in Europe 
is getting stronger and stronger through different drivers. That is society of ethical citizens, whistleblowers, free media, activism also. Back again to Aristotle. Plato is dear to me, but dear still is truth. So, European citizens, European athletes, Europeans, we need the truth about much fixing cases that on trial or is about to be in trial. What's next? Pay the bill, pay the players. Pay the players according to their contracts. Consider ser seriously the reports and the data. Zero tolerance and apathy. A visionary match tournament model. And of course, well discussed these days, sport whistleblowing. What's next about our work in, in the field? We're already running a project on sport whistleblowing where we can visit it on www.sportwhistle.eu and we kick off a new project about education and training on sport coaches about the threat of uh, match fixing. Thank you very much. I'm ready for any questions. Was there anything in your first research that uh, surprised you? Because if I look at the figures, I think uh, we almost had the same results, I think, in the Netherlands. But was there something that surprised you? It's, it's shocking, really. Oh. Sorry. It's shocking because uh, uh, for the first time we see that uh, European sport athletes are addicted to betting and gambling. They play on their own matches, and they don't know what they do. They are in young age, so you see the average is 23 years old, but we have very young athletes, even below the age, the, the age of 18, mm -hmm. and they bet, and they think it's a joke. Uh, this is very catastrophic for the soul of the athlete, and for the personality of the athlete, and the future of the athlete, because these young athletes, they are going to finish soon. They are going to be part of the match fixing gang. Because fi match fixers, they identify athletes that have addiction to doping, to, to, to match fixing, uh, to betting, and they approach them to, to fix the match. It's very easy for them. Yeah, I understand. But uh, we, in 2013, I was shocked um, that we found out that a lot of athletes gamble more than average in other eh, in eh, more than average in all other sectors. So I think that's a big danger, and we should do yeah. something about this. Yeah, I have to mention that these are scientific data, and we are going to present it in scientific journals. So there are all the evidence for the European at least betting companies to consider this and to be more responsible because they are making billions of euros. They have to consider our research, other research in the field, and do what they have to do according to the responsibilities they have to the national gaming regulation authorities. But not only because they are obliged, because they, they have obligations to the European society, to the citizens, and to the athletes. Thank you so much. I want now, uh, you want, yes, yeah, is that okay with you? <laughs> because <laughs> you're extra, <laughs> and uh, I like. Yeah, I don't, you know, I, I know that you, what your name is, Penny, but can you please introduce yourself? Yeah, That's introduce uh, okay, thank you. So, good evening to everybody. My name is Penny Konitsioti. I'm a sports lawyer uh, based in Athens, Greece, but uh, I'm involved in uh, also uh, players' contracts abroad, uh, international transfers to football clubs abroad, apart from Greek players. So, uh, due to my 11 years of uh, practicing in sports law, 
I handled some cases also uh, in connection to match fixing. I represented some players before the competent courts in Greece, civil and penal courts, uh, involving in this uh, aspect and um, uh, against, uh, against them uh, due to match, uh, match fixing uh, behavior. Due to the ongoing uh, uh, process, I will not mention any names or uh, situations, but I uh, would like to have an aspect following Nicola's presentation that, was, uh, that covered many, uh, many aspects and reasoning uh, why this uh, behavior occurs in, in Greece but in particular. I'd like to somehow represent some other factors in connection to the contractual structure and environment in Greece, as it has some high rates of mass fixing uh, cases. That has to do with the following. Um, the contractual structure, first, of the contracts. When a football player goes to sign a uh, play a contract with a football club, there is, uh, in this, at this moment, the environment is uh, really vague. In connection to what? In the, code, in the contract where there is uh, the applicable fees, wages, uh, bonuses, etc., due to the general situation of uh, tax uh, uh, legislation that changes all the time due to the financial crisis, the economic crisis in Greece, uh, there are uh, extraordinary um, tax uh, 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 terms and provisions that uh, change all the time. So, for example, since 2020, 20, there are applicable extraordinary tax levy, apart from players' uh, income, uh, taxation of 20% plus, uh, as if it's not enough that the income of the player is uh, taxated uh, to up to 45%. So there's no specific, there's no specific expression in the contract about uh, who is obliged to pay this obligation, this tax obligation, causes some insecurity to the players and to the, even, even uh, if they're uh, for, uh, foreigners or domestic Greeks. Uh, apart to that, Nicolas mentioned that, that uh, contracts are not paid by the clubs. Many times happens that to the first division, the second division as well of the football uh, clubs. Uh, in that case, the Greek players, because there is a um, distinction between the Greek players uh, and the jurisdiction that may uh, use, they uh, go to, and the foreign players. Uh, according to the um, applicable sports law in Greece, the Greek players uh, if they're not paid for more than 60 days of uh, their wages uh, and uh, bonuses and 30 days of uh, installments of the contracts, they can uh, place a claim against uh, the club uh, before the competent body of the Hellenic Football Federation. It's the Primary Economic Dispute Resolution Committee. And if there is an appeal, they can go to the arbitration co court of the Hellenic Federation. For the foreign players, uh, if there is no uh, different um, uh, provision in their contract with the football club, they can use the same procedure. It, otherwise, FIFA recognizes, uh, generally speaking, because it has uh, um, the international has mentioned this, uh, the contract due to the foreigner of the player, they can go to the uh, DRC, the Dispute Resolution, Resolution Chamber, and in case of appeal, before the Arbitration Court of Sports, uh, the CAS, as in the, that is based in Lausanne, and we usually do that for foreign players as um, when I represent foreign players, I, pre I prefer to, to uh, explicit, explicitly uh, um, say that uh, in case of a litigation, the foreign players can use this uh, court instead of the Greek courts because of the more easy to go and more um, accurate uh, decision making. There is a problematic though in Greece, that it, hap it doesn't happen to many countries regarding the football clubs, how their structure is made, due to the following, because uh, the football clubs in Greece are an anonymous company, a public limited companies. They're not unions, as, as for example, in Spain and other countries. So there is a, dis there is a dimension, different dimension between the union that founded this uh, limited company and the company, the limited company that operates the football club that is involving to the, the, the Super League and to the international also uh, uh, games as of UEFA, etc. In case of uh, relegation, the, because this is uh, happening um, often the last late years, uh, the anonymous companies, the public limited companies, the football clubs, are relegated to other categories. 
This is happening due to financial reasons, uh, due to the crisis, due to the use of the, of the legislation that is applicable. And in that case, when they go to, the, to relegate to an amateur category, the limited company stops existing. They go to a procedure of liquidation for um, at least three months, but it can go to the, to the never end uh, due to the uh, Greek legis legislation. And in that case, the players the outstanding amounts of, for, that uh, uh, has to be paid to them, have to be paid to them, what about? There are two choices in this situation. If the football club that is under liquidation has a assets at the stage of liquidation, the players can go to the uh, Hellenic football, play, uh, football Federation's committee to claim the money or to go to the civil courts. But if the football club, during the litigation process, has no assets, the only rest, uh, last resort for the players to get their money is to start proceedings before the civil and uh, penal courts only against the representatives, the, the physical entities, the representatives of the, and the football club that get relegated. In that case, they may lose their money. This is, happen this, uh, is happening really often the last years. Uh, many football clubs in Greece uses this uh, procedure, use this procedure in order to avoid paying uh, due payments to players and others, or not only to players, but we're talking about players now. So this is a main reason that a, a player may feel insecure when he knows that this situation goes on in Greece many times regarding football clubs, that if they get relegated. Um, apart from all this, there was up to recently, there was a dimension, a, a, a different approach between FIFA and the Hellenic Football Federation regarding the assignment of the debts of the football club that was relegated by the founding amateur union that still exists and participates to the amateur um, uh, plays, uh, uh, games uh, at the moment. Only last year, the season changed this approach in connection to the uh, football clubs and amateurs founding union. They are now uh, can be, the in the FIFA was, uh, was telling that no, uh, we're talking about the same entity. They use the, name, the same brand name as Barcelona, for example. There is only one union. They don't have a, a difference between the club and the union. There is only one, Barcelona. How come in Greece has uh, to be another name for the Greek the, the football club and another uh, entity for the amateur uh, union that uh, uh, founded this uh, uh, football club? Anyway, uh, this is a situation that goes on. And uh, apart to that, and due to the non-payments, due to this procedure for uh, the payments for the, for the, due to, uh, due to no payments to the football players, recently, two years ago, uh, the board of directors of the Lenin Football Federation um, established, created a special fund by the players union for the payment by the fund, this of the players union to, uh, to non, um, to the overdue, due to the overdue payments by the clubs. In order somehow to, um, uh, to, to cover this problem that hap is happening these years. This is uh, uh, known for two years now, but it's not operated. So players that are still are protected due to no operation of this uh, funding uh, uh, measure that was um, decisioned, but not operating. I would like to point out some uh, briefly because the time is uh, ending and I have, it's uh, really difficult to say so many things in such a short time. Some other factors that were already mentioned by Nicolaos and others, uh, other speakers as well. There are two uh, reasons, other factors. The betting gaining reasons, the betting related fixing, the betting related fixing as mentioned, and the non-betting. Non uh, when, uh, the, regarding to the non-related, bet, betting related uh, reasons, the clubs, the Greek clubs, demand some, on many occasions, by the, uh, demand the, the players to participate in match fixing due to uh, the need of winning in order to, to get uh, sponsorships by UEFA for the qualification to Champions League or to Europa League, or by other uh, domestic uh, sponsorships for the TV rights, for other sponsorships. So there is a, a really high demand due to the crisis as well as mentioned to get uh, money from sponsorship for that, for those reasons, and from these organizations. So they demand from the players to participate in match fixing, as well as is the UEFA financial fair, fair play system that is 
that sets new, new economic and uh, requirements and financial requirements and implementation. So uh, it gives a pressure to the clubs to fulfill all these requirements. And for that reason, they ask for more winning of the games. Many big clubs, not, not, uh, that happens to, many, to some occasions, not to all. Some, some conclusions as the time passes and uh, that the general security of the players for not receiving salaries and payments by the clubs in connection to the country's uh, late years ongoing economic crisis and the high tax uh, implementation and legislation that is changing randomly all of the time uh, is uh, creating uh, creates a situation of chaos insecurity and fear for the citizens in generally in general also in collaboration with the corruption ongoing that we all know, the people that we are uh, working in the business of the football business, we know that there is a general corruption behaviors in the football uh, worldwide. Um, in generally and uh, more specifically to betting uh, and to match fixing. All this leads to tax avoidance behaviors in general and sinking of money laundering. The, uh, to the market, to the, moder to the money laundering market. Um, and that's uh, the only way to do that, is to participate to match fixing. That's all for me. I remain at your uh, disposal for any queries, comments, whatever. Thank you. Thank you, Penny. Um, no, 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 but it's, <laughs> it's, it's, it's very hard to stay between yeah. the schedules of 10 minutes. But uh, you, you said the, the union, uh, there was a decision to, to set up this union, but what is the reason why this union is not uh, active today? What's the reason? Uh, is it finance? They were, okay, uh, uh, yeah. you're talking about the funding of the players yeah. by the union, the players' union, correct? Yeah, yeah but yeah. you said it is not working yet, yeah, you know, but working. what is the reason? Because there is, uh, this structure needs some time, there are obstacles, okay. even though the decision was made by the Hellenic Football Federation, there are obstacles to apply this, to organize yeah. by the players' union, which, is, which participates also to, also to the Fifth Pro. Yeah. So the legal counsel of the Fifth Pro is here. Yeah. Uh, I guess he knows also as well. Uh, they are doing a great job by the players' union, but there are obstacles by the federation. And from, from the general um, structure of the ongoing situation in order to, fa to facilitate, to organize it and to I function understand. it. So yeah. it's the, the difficult it in practice time. to work. It takes time and... Thank you so much. And I hope it... Uh, it will work. It will work <laughs> in the future. It, it works will. in the Netherlands, so... Yeah, uh, yeah hopefully in Greece uh, as well. So, yeah, no delayed payments okay. in the Netherlands. Paolo, can I ask you to come and talk to us? about the Italian way of dealing with the situation of match fixing. Well, thanks, Marion. Um, I'm, I'm here. Well, good afternoon to everybody. And um, uh, of course, thanks to the organiza organizers. Also, this session, I think, is being fruitful. And uh, specifically, the, the, the first two uh, uh, speeches. Uh, I didn't know that, Marion, and they are working in Germany now, and uh, if I got that in Belgium uh, uh, on these topics, we, we, receive, we welcome to receive these approaches which are enriching uh, our efforts to understand uh, uh, the, the, the old problem. I also started 2011-12 uh, uh, with the topic, and uh, the first uh, research we had it in 2013, so there is something similar to the work we have been doing. My background is uh, social research, applied to social programs and interventions, and uh, we have been working with the Italian Government Office for Sport. In the last three, four years, we have implemented a set of actions. We are here just to share some information. Some of you already know that, but maybe we, we can enrich them with some additional considerations. We had, uh, together with the Bet Monitor and uh, the Pre-Crime Bet and the initiative by Council of Europe, uh, KIKOS, just promoting the um, Magling and Macaulay Convention. We had uh, a specific program co-financed by the uh, European Commission, uh, which was more or less articulated in these activity, activities. I will go through uh, very, very quickly. Uh, first of all, the consortium. Uh, in the Italian case, we, we made an effort to organize uh, an effective multi-stakeholder multi private-public initiative. 
So the government, uh, the betting regulator, uh, even if external to it, uh, the Olympic Committee, the betting operators. Uh, uh, in our case, in, Ita in Italy, it was important to involve the common chambers because, unfortunately, as we, you, you all know, my homeland uh, is just home base for uh, organized crime. <laughs> but at the same time, we are pretty solid in fighting it, and uh, the commerce chambers play a role and uh, the a data that a data which, which can be useful for you is that uh, in Italy the uh, match fixing as a crime was introduced already in 1988 so we have uh, almost a tw almost 30 years of track record in our case Marion we had uh, many cases brought to the court many convictions <laughs> so uh, in the Italian situation uh, we have uh, a solid track record and many of these situations were connected to organized crime in, in, way, in, in way in another. And um, I, I can add just a comment. I think that we, we can, Mary and all of, all, of, all, of, all of us, we are, here, we are here and we are working on the topic, I think that we have to learn much by action. So uh, the learning by action in this case is very relevant and this intervention program that we have implemented in Italy has been, of course, useful because we have uh, in, uh, strengthened the intervention, but at the same time we had the opportunity to understand things that if you don't act, <laughs> uh, it's difficult to be done uh, just uh, from a desk point of view. Uh, so the consortium very, was very wide and it included also an NGO, Transparent, the Italian chapter of Transparency International, and so, um, in, now we have a very relevant uh, stake, multi-stakeholder approach involving, as a matter of fact, all actors uh, with interest. The first, uh, we can have a look, if you can just click, uh, I don't know if I can do that, uh, no, uh, directly, no. If somebody can click on the first link, yes, thanks. Uh, we simply have a look very quickly to the website program. We, I, we, I, we will leave. This is just the web. It was the project financed. Now this, this, this project has become, with the same name, a long-term intervention program. So it has been refunded by the Italian government and by the Italian betting operators. So in this case, we were successful in transforming an EU-funded project into an in intervention program. We will not go into details, but for anybody interested in it, we have it. Please, if, you can get, if we can go back to the previous slide, we can just have the, others, the other link. If, we, if you can do that, I am depending on you. Yes, this, the, the, the other element that we have introduced, please, if you can click to the second link, uh, we have introduced uh, a protected reporting system. As far as we know, it is the first one that, uh, the first time that a government directly implements a protected reporting system. Uh, we will not go through all through it, uh, but um, it has been conceived uh, uh, in such a way that we balance the role of the platform in promoting uh, uh, values of sport, good practices, at the same time uh, in such a way attracting uh, sport operators, sport clubs, federations and everybody uh, in order just to facilitate the protected reporting, which is very complicated. It's not, uh, we can go back to the, to the previous slide. Um, the, um, we have a pilot area, this is the key element. We have a pilot area in Palermo where we, are involved, we have already involved sign agreements with all sport clubs over there, federations, Olympic Committee, because the protected reporting system, uh, according to our evaluation, is going to work if there is a solid legitimacy and uh, cooperation framework. If we, go, we have an, an integrated synoptic frame which will help us taking decisions and, uh, and sharing evaluations within the national platform. We, uh, no, uh, okay, this is, and that the other, which is a key element, is, is the um, a cooperation room at international, for the moment, mainly European. We have this need, as we have seen, Greece, uh, Netherlands, all, each country, to be very effective at national level, so the international connections are relevant if we are solid at national basis. Otherwise, it's just wasting time. 
Uh, so first of all, we have to be very focused, very well focused in trying to generate something good at national level. And the key element, as far as we see, is just if you are solid, you can start at that point to have cooperation with. So we have a dedicated web website where we already have uh, interaction with a selected number of European countries. Uh, just to conclude, uh, not, please not, not the video yet, but uh, um, we had a very relevant passage uh, a couple of weeks ago, uh, as I, I was personally leading the Italian delegation at the COSP7, and we proposed a resolution uh, together with the Minister of for Foreign Affairs. As, was, as I was telling you, unfortunately, my country is pretty solid in fighting organized crime. I can ensure you that many judges and prosecutors have been killed, so the fight is very solid. And uh, it has been, to some extent, very successful in Sicily in the last 20 years. Now the, the problem has moved somewhere else. But uh, uh, we had uh, a UN resolution adopted on corruption and sport by consensus at Vienna. So uh, since now on, we have a framework recognized by United Nations concerning the relation between corruption and sport. This is very important for all of us. As we were saying, and also uh, the previous uh, speakers, we need to develop strong relations also with Asia, with Africa, with Latin America, because the prosecutors, I, I just got an email a few uh, minutes ago from the Brazilian prosecutor, uh, prosecutor who was here uh, at, at the forum, uh, also with the French one we are in contact. So the prosecution part, of course, the sports radar uh, um, reports and everything are very relevant. They, can, they, they indicate you elements, but the investigation on field, the capacity of having evidences to start the investigation is crucial. Uh, the, the analysis that we have heard by the two young uh, scholars and uh, researchers who might help also just in this direction. Anyway, uh, we have an, 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 an last element, if you can just send in a couple of seconds the video that we have uh, just on the uh, TVs for five weeks, and we got already, of course, some reports in the platform. Now it's being uh, diffused also by the web. We will just develop it even more. But just to give you just the idea that uh, also the communication part in the fight against match fixing and the, for sport integrity is a relevant part. So having broadcasted at national level for a few weeks just this sport, has helped us into putting the team into very high in the agenda. Thanks. Um, I want to invite all the speakers to uh, sit here because we only have one, half an hour left uh, for, uh, for the discussion. And um, are there any questions in, uh, do you have any questions? Are there no questions? Yeah, there is a question here. Yeah, you did perfect. <laughs> I, am an, I, I used to be still compete an athlete, so 10 minutes perfect. Ten, 10 minutes time frame. <laughs> okay. Hello, my name is Matthias Sally. I'm a sports journalist from Hungary. I would like to ask Marius that when I was reading about match fixing and I spoke to some actual guys who were doing match fixing and they said one of the reasons why they did it and maybe they were lying to me that oh all of a sudden the club was in a very bad financial situation and I have to feed my family so I was started fixing games to get an extra income. Can you calculate in, in your analysis the financial state of the clubs or if there is a change in the financial structure of the club as a variable. Hello. Um, uh, so far we take into account the um, fixed income for every player. So um, what does he, or how much money does he make besides um, winning a win bonus for the tournament that might be relevant um, to determine the financial situation of that person, like how badly does he need money to feed his family or to do whatever he wants. So yeah, that is taken into account right now, but needs to be further extended, obviously. Thank you. Can I add something to this? 
Yeah, you want to? No, you cannot. <laughs> uh, I'm the boss. Uh, 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 yes, we were talking about the, the financial situation of the athletes. Yes, but uh, I will tell you what. In Greece, major teams like Panathinaikos, which is one of the most prestigious Athenian club, is bankrupted now. And uh, I have collected all the financial uh, balance sheets and profit and loss accounts of the Super League, which is the first category. And even Olympiakos uh, is unable to stabilize its profit and uh, balance accounts. Meaning what? Meaning that even the staff of the major football clubs in Greece are struggling to survive. Can you imagine what happens to the players? Uh, and I want to add to Penny's analysis about the salaries and uh, about the financial situation. Uh, referees in Greece are, are still unpaid for the previous season. What a nice business for the match fixers. But how can you solve this? Because if there is no money, you cannot solve it. Uh, in Greece, we are trying to solve uh, uh, the bankruptcy of the country. We are trying to, to survive yeah. in other terms of life. Yeah. So uh, we see football and sport as a mirror of the general problem in Greece. Because corruption, integrity issues, transparency, uh, is now touches every part of uh, our life. Mm -hmm. as uh, citizens. Mm -hmm. So sport is, uh, uh, and, and especially football and basketball, mm -hmm. uh, is a target for uh, Asian match fixer now. Mm -hmm. And according to my view, there is a mafia gang uh, syndicate based in Thessaloniki, and from there, they're coordinating all the match fixing network around the Balkans, including Cyprus and Turkey. You think the, that clubs in the future will go bankrupt because this is not a, uh, this this situation cannot go on, increase. I don't know if the uh, the championship of this year is going to finish because even the Greek Football Federation is facing financial problems to to pay the employees, mm. and they are asking aid and solidarity from UEFA now to pay mm. at least the referees. No. That they are still unpaid from the previous season. And now they are, uh, they are practicing uh, judging at the games without uh, any payment. They are mm. waiting to get paid. It's a desperate situation. Yes, Penny. Uh, may I add something to that? Exactly what I was saying was that, that uh, there is a practice recent years that many football clubs do that. They get to the bank bankruptcy uh, procedure, to liquidation, as I explained. Mm -hmm. And for that reason, they avoid payments. Yeah. They sign a big, a huge contracts with players from abroad. They, they have clients from abroad, apart from Greek players, that they come and say, Penny, what's going on? My player uh, has two years from now. I'm already not, not paid already one year or six months or whatever. They told me to get patience, but to have patience. But now the club goes to bankruptcy and liquidation. What's going on with my payments, my fees, my salaries, my contract in general? Mm -hmm. So this is a... Um, a tactic that goes on the recent, the recent years, but um, there is, uh, I believe that's going to get changed that because FIFA also requires, uh, generally speaking, and uh, uh, there has to be some uh, modification of the ongoing sports legislation regarding this to avoid, uh, to not, to not be permitted these uh, tactics anymore. And the clubs do ongoing, even though they have debts, uh, huge debts to the country, to tax, uh, to players, to whatever, mm -hmm. to whoever, but still go to go on and to try to fix this and mm -hmm. not go get a bankruptcy, uh, bankruptcy and to go to that uh, model mm -hmm. of avoidance. Yeah, I understand. Are there any more questions? Yes. yes. Yes, hello. Uh, my name is Martin. I'm a PhD candidate from Denmark. And since I'm uh, working on the topic of match fixing, I have a question uh, to uh, Professor Office. Yeah. Since you mentioned uh, uh, the dark net um, and, uh, as a platform for match fixing, have you uh, investigated how many uh, match fixing sites in the dark net, for example, are authentic and offer uh, and how many of the results are real or not just camps? 
No, it was just um, um, this research has been done by someone who worked before, I think, uh, for Europol or Interpol or something, and we added it uh, to the report later on because it added value, I think, to the broader perspective of uh, what we know currently about match fixing. But um, I don't have these kind of figures. What we see is that, um, uh, um, of course, there are betting companies who are not authorized, of course, in the European countries. They are, uh, some people are betting on these kind of uh, betting companies. But we think also that these betting companies are used by licensed operators, for example. So um, I think it's, it's just a start. Um, we know that there is a dark net, uh, web. We know that there is anonymous payment. We know that it's big risk because, of course, criminals and, uh, and to, to stay unknown for the whole world. So that's really a huge risk for match fixing. Um, so I think we need to to learn a lot more about um, who is there, uh, who operates, uh, especially I'm also working in the field, for example, on sexual abuse in, uh, in sports, and that was Sunday. Uh, what we see there is that you need to go undercover and uh, on the dark web yourself, also bet to get invited in these kind of yeah, areas where it's really dark and then you get all this information. But it's, um, it's, a difficult, it's very difficult to research this part of the web. Yeah, uh, the, um, and the interesting aspect would be um, how, how successful are the offered results in the darknet, for example, because there's a lot of scam in, in darknet as, as well. Yes, of course, yeah. and if you don't trust uh, a website, or um, th then of course you lose interest yeah, because you lose money. That, that's easy. So there must the the offer on even on the dark web must be trustworthy to a certain extent. So what we think, of course, is uh, if you want to launder money or something, it's good to go undercover and maybe you can use the, uh, the dark web in some way. So um, I think we need far more research to be done, but it's really tough. We see it, of course, with uh, uh, child abuse. Hey, you also have to go undercover. You have to be introduced in this kind of group of people. And for me, um, um, I started also to research this topic in Croatia. I have a small house in Croatia and, I, and, and what I learned is then for about a, a couple of days I went with a professional player betting, uh, he was betting in the night, during the night, so I had to stay awake all night and uh, I learned a lot how it works and I think still we need so much research to be done because this man was introduced, for example, to a group of people and he didn't even know he was approached by the internet because he is one of the sharks, we call them sharks, the sharks, they fool the system because they know how to bet and they know how to earn money via the internet and this guy I met, he is really a whiz kid. He is uh, very good in mathematics and he knows exactly when to bet, how to bet, what moment to bet. So he got approached by a couple of people and they told him, okay, you can keep 50% and the rest is for the group. And we give you uh, more education about how you can win more money. And he also had these kind of scroll cards and these are anonymous cards and he could pull out money wherever he wanted, uh, whenever he wanted. And I asked him all the time, do you know these other people there? And he said, no, we, may, we meet each other on the web and I make a lot of money. And he still lives till, till today. He earns a lot of money. But how it works and who are behind, we don't know. We absolutely don't know. So there is a lot of research to be done. And I think this is a big danger. For me, I think we introduced with the betting market a new financial system. And although we have now in the banking industry, we have all these regulations, we have laws in place, we have regulations in place. And we, do, we, we are making up all these systems. But in the end, we have this betting market and we don't know nothing about it. 
it's, it's international and it's working almost the same like the financial market. So we need more research to be done to fight this and also the banks must be, yeah, they, had, they need to wake up because there is a danger. But that's, I'm uh, the chair, you know, I have to. Uh, are there um, any more questions? Yeah, the microphone. Yeah, just a, just a very quick question uh, related to Marius's presentation. Sorry, I'm Marcus Hoy, I work for Play the Game. Um, Marius, you, uh, you were talking about a kind of virtual um, world where you can kind of input data and, um, um, you know, try and, try and get motivate, try, try and figure out people's motivations from that. Can you just let me know, have you put any real data into these systems? And um, is the intention to put real data in there so to, to understand the motivations? Because it was all theoretical from what I could understand. Um, yeah, I hope it became clear that the effort or the approach to put real data in it is definitely there. Um, what's like the real data that is in there now is based on the ATP 100 tennis world. So as I said, we have 100 athletes and um, so wh what we took from there is the age, and um, you can find online the so-called win-loss index, and um, that is based on the talent strength, which I introduced in the model, and which is then um, important for the evaluation of the athlete that is targeted. But yeah, um, there needs to be a lot more data in it, obviously, and um, that's basically the plan for the future. Yeah, you, you said that you've put in like, uh, the amount of the bribe, the win bonus, the potential sanctions if they're caught, um, all, all these things that you could be useful in, 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 in a real life scenario with like real potential sanctions and real win bonuses, etc. That, that's the idea of it, right? Yeah, basically. <laughs> Paolo, you wanted to... Well, just uh, well, connecting to these considerations we are sharing right now, uh, I, I think it would be any way useful for those present and as, an, as, an, as a note for the future just to take, uh, we have been saying that uh, very seriously in, in, in a couple of meetings in the last weeks, uh, that of course it's very important to have analytical models in, and, and a solid interpretation capacity and we mm -hmm. are gaining that. Mm -hmm. uh, this modeling can help us, many other elements, the drivers, of course, the psychologists and whatever. But we have to remember, as far as our experience is teaching us, that we have also to include a solid component of, uh, just to use an expression, boots on ground. We have mm -hmm. to be mm -hmm. in the pitches, we have to be there with the coaches, with the, with the players, with the... Mm -hmm. we, have, we have to not, we don't have to make also the, the monitoring systems and whatever. We cannot solve this problem just from too far away. Mm -hmm. We must be there where athletes are, where coaches are, where sport officials are. And this is, as in any war, very difficult because it requires resources, time, uh, efforts, uh, being with the boots of ground and fighting the uh, organized crime in Italy has taught many things in the last 40, 50 years. You can do many, many things, but if you don't go there with soldiers, with officials, with the law enforcement agencies, with companies which can uh, just employ people, mm -hmm. avoiding that the mafia employs them, that you have to fight them there, the same in sports. It yeah. is for doping, it is for match fixing, we must be there on the ground with the sport, associations, clubs, uh, otherwise all these systems will be somehow useful but they will never work at the end, thanks. No. Are there more questions? Yes, Bill. Well, my question is uh, for, uh, for Els. Uh, I was curious if you um, did look into or intend to look into the, the moral uh, convictions of uh, women and then to compare it with, uh, with men. So I think that would be interesting. Um, <laughs> I looked into the difference for, the, for male and female athletes mm. when it came to badminton. And there we see that uh, men are more um, willing to say that losing in, an intentional loss is a strategy, whereas women will see this uh, rather as a match-fixing uh, act. So that was a, a, a remarkable difference between 
males and females. Now we know this also from more general uh, research uh, done in the past that uh, for, yeah, there are a lot of men here, but, and I don't want to offend anyone but you are more of a fraud than, than we are, so... Uh, it's, a, it's a bit of <laughs> half. That's a statement. No, <laughs> that's proven, and that's science. So, uh, any more questions? I thought, yeah. yeah. Uh, my name is David Naert from VRT Sport in Belgium. Uh, something that I've been wondering for a long time is the accepted presence of betting companies, mainly in football, as sponsors. I see them on screen all the time if I look at a, a Belgian league game. Uh, Anderlecht, one of the bigger clubs in Belgium, is sponsored by Betway, a company that has been named in the Paradise Papers with very dodgy origins. Does that create, maybe it's a question in first instance for Nicolaus, does it create maybe a, a, um, a sense of more acceptance for players, making it easier for them to, to you know, go into match fixing? And should football, in fact, be sponsored by such companies? You are raising the issue of a conflict of interests, as far as I understand. But I will tell you something worst. How is about a businessman owing at this time two clubs, football clubs, in Greece and England? I'm talking about the president, the ex-president, because now he's not president anymore, of Olympiakos Piraeus FC Club, who is at the same time president and owner of Nottingham Forest, UK. There must be a regulation as far as the betting companies and advertisement because I consider betting similar to alcohol and tobacco. Why do we don't see in Greek TV and Greek media tobacco and alcoholic advertisements because there is a, a Greek state law. So, in Europe, at least in European state countries, I suggest not to have advertisement, at least in the uh, harsh, harsh hours in TV or wherever, advertisements about betting. Because kids and youths they are watching these advertisements and they, and they see their role models wearing t-shirts, uniforms, advertising a betting company. Uh, your comment is it's really a crucial one and, and it's for true a, a conflict of interest in the business sector. Take it as example Mr. Marinakis, the president of Olympiakos. Uh, practically he can be president of 25 clubs in Europe at the same time. Can you imagine what match fixing opportunities a man like this can have? Yeah, what we see, of course, is that in some countries is it not allowed, but in other countries it is. And we, um, so, uh, but when it comes, for example, to open markets like Australia and even now in the UK, uh, I think there's even more discussion about the role of, uh, of betting companies um, playing a role in, of course, sponsorship deals and so on. Of course, there is a conflict of interest, uh, there might be a conflict of interest, right. but also inside information and, and so on. So uh, I think uh, we have to be really, really careful about this. And also, uh, especially when it comes to youth. Well, it, it's very relevant just uh, to clarify that uh, first, uh, it, uh, betting operators are the first victims of match fixing. We have, of course, in our in every in every country, uh, in Italy, we are in Italy we are cooperating very strictly with the betting regulators and with the betting operators. Uh, the most of the match fixing problem does not lie in the legal betting market, but in the illegal betting market. And the legal betting market is crucial to 
avoid the, the legal betting market uh, expands over a sort of physiological level. So uh, we, don't, we, we have to divide very clearly between uh, gambling operators, all the gambling, and the sports betting market. We, all, we always had, all over Europe, in Italy, it was very relevant in the 40s, 50s, 60s, 70s, 80s, the historical betting market. Everybody could just do that. It was a social practice. There was no structural match fixing till the end of the 80s. So uh, the discussion on betting market has to be very, it's a serious, serious one, of course, but we, cannot, we must avoid the simplifications and saying that if we don't, as far as the Italian case is, if we don't advertise, we are just solving the problem, not at all. Uh, if we advertise the legal market, we are fighting the illegal market, which is not tracked, which is not controlled. So, the, 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 and of course, I'm, I'm talking about the betting sports market, not about the gambling as a general. Unfortunately, but this is part of the market, most of the operators do both activities. But we must be very careful in uh, generating a sort of uh, uh, criminalization of legal betting operators because they are by large part of the solution and not part of the problem. But the, the question is, of course, uh, if you talk about tobacco, if you talk about alcohol, is it a normal product? That's another discussion. Huh? Is this a normal product? If I am rich, do I start a betting company or sell some furniture or something? You know, I, is it a normal? Because there, ad, I can get addicted to this kind of stuff and not to all the other stuff. And the other hand, um, I'm a bit worried that there are close connections sometimes. But only uh, last uh, uh, penny because I think I have to uh, close. close penny because uh, I just wanted to um, to uh, to be you know to the, so the same page with Paolo regarding that because we have to somehow separate legal actions and illegal. Uh, it is uh, legal to bet, of course. That's why these companies exist. That's why that's why they operate. They have, there is a legislation applicable to protect uh, uh, the part of the better, better the, pe the people that bet, and uh, the companies as well, and the, the way of uh, operation. And so that's the reason why they get adverti advertisements to the, uh, to the games, to stadiums, because it's legitimate to do so. This is something different. Uh, malfunction or uh, uh, illegal activity is something different as well. I'm totally at the same page. And we need to be really, uh, you know... <laughs> Historically, the autonomy of sport was funded since uh, 19, uh, 19 hand, uh, 19th century was funded on betting. So the betting was the crucial element to make sport autonomous on many respects. Uh, we can just have any academic discussion or whatever you want, but uh, only the second part of, of 20th century we started having sponsoring which is to some extent also a, a, a crucial element. But if we start saying that the betting is the problem, the problem is this mismanagement of the betting, the illegal marketing, everything which is not working around exactly. the betting market, but not the betting market in itself. Of course, we can also discuss that if you want, on a moral basis or whatever, but historically, I can justify any of you, this has been the basis of the autonomy of sport and the financing of sport for one century and a half. And in Italy, this has guaranteed the fact that the sport was not managed by fascism and by fascism heritage since World War II. This was the betting mar autonomous betting market. In this case, it was just managed directly by the state, but the, 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 the money went directly to the federations. So the point is just being very... Uh, specific in the politic in the actions, we know that the problem exists. But if we start having, I appreciate you, Nicolas. You know how uh, how much I love you. But we cannot just start saying betting, uh, gambling. Uh, this is the problem. We have to find intelligent, smart, and efficient solutions for a very complicated and uh, complex problem. Okay. Last question, and then we close the session. 
Thank you so much. My name is Ramunia Bistritskait. I'm uh, working for Sport Rira as a head of public, European Public Affairs. Just uh, two brief comments. Uh, first uh, comes to research uh, else uh, that you mentioned. Uh, indeed, I uh, fully agree with you. This is a very thin line uh, between uh, sporting tactic and uh, um, uh, fixing, m match fixing not related to betting, indeed. And you mentioned it, uh, example, very fair example from London Olympics. But my comment, uh, when the Chinese uh, Chinese um, uh, uh, athletes were competing in badminton, but uh, my short comment: where, is, where can we define the tactic from 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 uh, not uh, match fixing not related to betting? These are the evidences. In this case, there were agreements, there were males uh, fixing the match. So evidences could 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 uh, draw the line, uh, thin, at least thin, uh, between these, these, these two uh, things. And uh, the second comment goes to, uh, I want to reflect uh, on, on uh, uh, what, uh, what Professor Paolo mm. Bertaccini uh, told. Uh, indeed, I fully agree which should be, which would be uh, close to, to athletes, referees, which should be uh, clearly on the ground. And what Sport Radio is doing, we monitor. We, by the way, we, we are monitoring not, not only legal market, but uh, broadly also illegal. Legal. We, no. yeah. This is we. We can provide a full, clear picture, uh, including mm -hmm. including uh, black market. And uh, uh, what I want to mention, additionally, uh, our successful recent four CAS cases. So uh, our uh, data is involved. Our reports are used. Uh, yeah. We helped FIFA UEFA uh, to tackle match fixing. In uh, just a two example in, from last year, this is Canterbury case involving Albanian uh, Albanian football club. Uh, just a recent one involving uh, Ghanaian referee Lampte. As a result, the match has been re replayed this month after one year. So what when I say these are the huge achievements. Uh, and yeah, that's uh, true, because uh, it was the first case that's, that's really dependent on, on the monitoring systems. Yes, uh, uh, this is a historical moment. Yeah. Uh, myself, as a sports lawyer, I can mention it. But uh, to, to, to stay modest, uh, uh, and um, we hope, we really hope that these kind of cases uh, should be a huge encouragement for sport movement to clean ha the house, not wait for, for public authorities, not wait for law enforcement, activities, yeah. but first of all, clean the house uh, at the initial stage. And I have heard that the Belgian uh, criminal police, even uh, considering to use our reports uh, and our data for criminal cases, mm -hmm. I think this is the future anyway. Uh, this is a tool which, which can be used uh, for criminal cases uh, as well. I'm not naive. I know I'm a sports lawyer. Mm -hmm. I know this is a different standard of proof. Of yeah. course, uh, now, according to CAS cases, uh, we, uh, this is a requirement of uh, comfortable satisfaction. Uh, criminal cases, uh, they need behind a reasonable doubt. But uh, we need a courage. We need a courage uh, to go together, of course, uh, cooperate, cooperate a lot and uh, go, go far. Thank you so much. Thank you for your comment. And then I will close the session. But of course, I thank you all that you took the time and you to ask all these questions. And uh, let's have a drink.